you're always there. Action Force are there. Action Force will dare. Action Force. Now, your host, Joe Slepsky. Hello again, everybody, and welcome back to Joe on Joe. It is me, your host, Joe Slepsky. And uh, we're we're here this week for a very special series of episodes uh, that I think you listeners are going to absolutely enjoy. Uh, remember, for you new listeners, this is the podcast where I've covered every episode of the DIC show, the Sunbow show, the extreme. We've also talked about all the issues of uh, the Marvel Comics Real American Hero series. And I've been working my way through a lot of the remnant stuff from the 90s. And so uh, this week... You're here for episode one, where it's me and a very special guest. We're going to talk about a series of books over the course of a series of episodes uh, in a a format, in a show I like to call Joe Nye Loves Action Force. Welcome to the show, G.I. Joe fan, G.I. Joe letters, column hack, Michael Nye. Michael, welcome to Joe Nye Loves Action Force. Thank you, Joe. It's good to be here. It is so good to have you on. Um, Ladies and gentlemen, Michael is a cinematographer out here in Los Angeles. He's originally from Madison, Wisconsin. He's a massive G.I. Joe fan. He's got his bona fides, and he absolutely was in a recent issue. I want to was it Duke? No, or Cobra no, Commander. No, it had to be. Or no, it was Real American Hero. Of course, <laughs> I had three choices and I got both wrong. Um, so you, you were a recent issue of of, of Real American Hero three oh four five something like that. It was the second issue they printed the letters in. So yeah, oh yeah, three oh four. Yeah, he showed up there. That's at least three. I think Joe on Joe guests that have been in the letters column. <laughs> what can I say you got some heavy hitters coming? I do. Through. I really do. I know the right people. Um, uh, and what? Tell the readers, remind the readers what your uh, readers, listeners, remind the listeners what your what your letter was letter was all about. Oh well, you know, it, uh, I was born in the '80s. You know, like the I got my first GI Joe action figure in 1987, and so you know, subscription service through the late '80s, and you know, uh, my older brother was a big influence on me getting mm-hmm. into GI Joe and. And uh, I've loved it all my life. It's become, you know, more than an obsession and uh, just part of, you know, who I am. And and I never took the time to write in, despite the fact I always enjoyed reading the post box. Sure, pit. sure. And um, were you? Did you follow the the travails of Lone Wolf? Remember Lone? Do you remember the Lone Wolf controversy from the the mid uh, like eighty six through eighty nine era? No, actually, oh, we, uh, we talked about it on this show a lot. Thanks for being a listener. Just totally kidding. I am absolutely kidding. No, there was the there was the guy. Someone was writing me. it in the letters column. They were calling themselves Lone Wolf. Then someone else came along. They said, "I'm the Lone Wolf." That's right. And- <laughs> That's right. Jogging the memory. Need a, another and cup of we coffee. Never got a, a full resolution of who was the true Lone Wolf. That's true. That is true. Well, I decided to use my real name and not my code name. <laughs> so you were Lone Wolf <laughs> this whole time. Breaking news. Breaking news. I can neither confirm nor deny. <laughs> so uh, did, now, I, I've also never even tried writing. To, it's not like I've, I've written and it's never – I've never sent a letter to a comic book publisher, even when I was a kid. Um, this is my first time. Do you get any notice that – you that they're using it or is it completely blind no no it was it was a surprise you know yeah. you just uh you, you write in and i know a lot of people obviously with the relaunch have been writing sure in and, yeah and uh, i guess i just put a lot of time and thought into it mm-hmm. and um i honestly thought it was too long but uh there it was printed uh Exciting. not edited and, and you e- and uh, it's uh, via email correct no, yeah not. via email i mean i we still send, you know, we still have stamps in our house. And, uh, yeah. and uh, if that was, if that was, a, uh, you know, uh, well, part I, of the requirement, we, I would have sent in a real letter. I but. don't know if you know this, but you would have been mailing about six blocks that way. No, 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 no more than that. Sorry. About two miles that way. Oh, okay. Yeah, it's a little more, for, a little further than that. Skybound is right down the street Too from, funny. Where we're, from where we're recover, recording today. Small yeah. world. It is a very small world. And if you're listening, Skybox, Sky, I say Skybox, Skybound. If you're listening, Skybound, that means we need to do an in-person interview is what that means. That's right. Um, 
So that's exciting. So you picked up the issue and there it was, or, or did, were you expecting it? Like it was, did it take you, did someone alert you to it first? No, I, I honestly, I read the story first and then, and then I read, you know, the letters and I read the first letter, which wasn't mine. And then, and then I saw mine and I, you know, no, I didn't, I didn't, you know, I didn't cheat, you know, I, I had to, you know, did you buy an extra copy to cut it out, frame it on your I, wall? I, I don't know if I could cut open or cut cut apart an, an issue of gi joe but i definitely did buy an extra copy yeah you and, did uh, and i was quick to give my brother a call and say hey so uh we should go over this issue and uh we talked about it and sure enough he uh he that's was like, that's great he was impressed that's so. great is your brother uh still into gi joe like to you guys is that something you guys can bond over still a hundred percent yeah yeah i mean he's he's got a full plate three kids you know oh, yeah. uh he's a high school teacher back in burlington wisconsin but uh you know Oh, we got Wild Bill. Wild Bill attacking overhead. Circling above. Circling above. <laughs> Thanks, Bill. Um, but yeah, yeah, yeah. It's it's a love that we share, absolutely. And I have him to thank for uh, my acquisition of the USS Flag. Um, this was oh, years ago now, but exciting. didn't have it as a child. Uh -huh. And then right as he was going off to college, as kind of a, you know, sorry I'm leaving Christmas gift. Yeah. Well, uh, we're going to take a pause real quick while Wild Bill hovers overhead. All right, everybody, we're back. And actually, uh, you you didn't hear the full extended break. We've been on break now for, I think, close to 45 minutes because 500 feet away from my house, there was an extended police helicopter presence as a man armed with a knife and a flaming trash can was in a standoff with the police, and I'm not making any of that up. Michael, corroborate this. A disciple of scrap iron, no doubt. Yes. <laughs> He was on a, uh, he, he had climbed up a telephone pole and was waiting with a rocket machine to uh, shoot at, actually that, that reminds me, uh, I did text Toilet Teal to hold on and not come home until it was resolved. Let me tell her as we're doing this live on the air. It's safe. It's safe to come home. Okay. Action, action Force is there. Action Force has shown up, everybody. That was uh, that was exciting. So that threw us off the that threw us off our rhythm a little bit. But but what happened in the off times is we started talking about comic collection. And Michael, tell uh, tell the listeners about like what what your personal comic collection uh, adventure with GI Joe has been. Yeah. So I mean, it's it's very grassroots. Um, you know, I think I started in you know the mid. 60s 70s as a kid and you know subscription service comics and mm -hmm. and it but it was always gi joe i mean yes i read other things you know we got a few other subscription comics but but gi joe was the one that stuck so do most years issues have the middle fold then from the subscription yeah yeah so uh <laughs> but but you know i there's something I, I love the nostalgia of you know this is the issue i read as a kid and, yeah and, oh yeah um and, i love i love knowing there's certain books of mine that aren't you know, spectacular by any means, but I know that they're beat up because of I got them this way or I got them that way or, you know, like the the, the rich history behind that specific issue. Yeah. I don't necessarily need to get a mint version of it. I've got that issue. Well, and, you know, I like to be able to open it up and read it and uh, yeah. I don't need white gloves to do that. And I like to share it with, you know, the nephews and that kind of thing. Yeah. And, now, so. do you have a uh, do you have a complete run of the of the regular uh, Real American Hero? With the exception of the G.I. Joe special number one okay. that we were discussing, uh, okay. which some may or may not include in that. Um, I recently did complete that collection. Um, it is not, you know, it's not mint in any way, but I have I have all the issues in my possession. So Awesome. Uh -huh. Awesome. And uh, your Action Force journey began when you, you bought a complete 50 issue run. Right. No, no, or, not all at once. Not was, all at once. Oh, okay. No, so okay, so this was during the pandemic. Yeah. When, you know, some of us, not all of us, but some of us had more time on our hands than usual. <laughs> and uh and I came across a number of G.I. Joe slash action force related podcasts. Um your podcast came along. Um, Thank you. But but before um Joe on Joe, I uh, actually discovered Talking Joe. And at that time, you know, it was still being headed up by uh, a couple of, well, one in particular, bloke out of England, and and so there was one episode, one podcast episode on on Action Force, and uh, and there were a few others, but uh, I realized it was something I knew very little about, and it just got me thinking, you know, um, my heyday was, you know, eighty seven, eighty eight, when I really, GI Joe really took hold, you know, in my heart. 
And uh, it just got me thinking, you know, well, if I had been growing up across the pond, what would my experience have been? And I know, as I've learned a little more, that over in England, you know, they were a couple years behind as far as the toy releases and that kind of thing. And so um, Action Force, you know, really was in its heyday, um, just as I was getting into it in the States. And so... Um, I wanted to learn more about it. I mean, you know, I'm, I'm in my 40s now and, and uh, realize I, I knew little about Action Force. And mm-hmm. what was it other than, was it just a rebranding or was it a retelling? And as soon as I had heard that there was original content being produced in England that, you know, was not for initially American readers, it just got me thinking, okay, well, what haven't I read? Yeah, And, uh, and so... I got online, I I looked at, you know, where I could pick up a few copies of Action Force here or there for, you know, not a lot of money. And and I got maybe half or a little more than half, um, you know, fairly reasonably here in the States. Various vendors had them. Um, But as I got more into it, you know, of course, I didn't have to be a completionist, but I'm like, well, I have to read these stories that I've never read. So I got to at least, you know, get my hands on these issues somehow. And, um, And so I ended up in the end, knowing that I was going to be uh, going to Star Wars Celebration in London, uh, finding a few of the issues, because, you know, shipping from England is just exorbitant. It's crazy. Especially, yeah. like, for one issue or something. And uh, found a, a, a guy over there who had almost a complete run mm-hmm. and uh, had the issues I was missing and that I couldn't find anywhere here in the States. And um, I said, well, I'm going to be over your way, uh, you know, for Star Wars Celebration. What if you just, uh, I pay you now and, and I'll pick them up when I get there. Mm-hmm. And uh, so we did a little Jason Bourne-esque exchange. Oh, exciting. And uh, so I, I hand carried from England, you know, the the last remaining copies that I didn't have. Um of Action Force Weekly is what we're talking about. It ran 50 issues from, from I guess it was February, no, March of 1987 to February of 1988. Mm-hmm. And um, so, yeah. And it's the magazine format size. Uh, they're, 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 they're printed on thinner uh, newsprint. Not newsprint. That's not newsprint? No, because it's glossy, right? This is... Oh, yeah, I guess it's... Well, it's glossy. Yeah, I guess it's glossy. It's... Yeah, no, it is. It's more... It's like... um. People magazine print. There you go. Whatever that. Uh, you know what's funny? I used to. Uh, my old bosses are screaming right now. I used to sell paper for a living, so I used to should have known what this was. I should not have called it newsprint. I would say definitely they are thinner, but also like the quality of the imagery is vibrant and. Oh, and it's very vibrant. It really pops. Yeah, this doesn't yeah, fade. The gloss pops. The colors know? are really great. Um, the art styles on all these are very consistent with the the. Real American hero style at the time, yeah. So it fits right in. Lots of um, strong uh, like uh, holds on the blacks and the inks and stuff. So that for me, that really pops with GI Joe. I really think there's a that that heavy shadowed, uh, more realistic like visual really works well with GI Joe versus a more stylized, cartoony superhero heroy look. Sure, um, I think that really works. So today we're talking about issues one through six. Of Action Force. That's right. Action Force Weekly. Action Force Weekly. Interna- international international heroes. That's right. Um, if you've got them, break them out and go through them with us. We're not doing a full-on like Joe on Joe page by page thing, but we're going to be covering uh, each issue for a few minutes. And if you've got them, go through us. Otherwise, they are available on the Baron website, right? Yeah, so you won't be able to find. Obviously, if you have the actual issue in your hands, you get to see all the adverts and uh, you know everything in between the pages. Um, but they do have on bloodforthebaron dot com. You can go and you can read the actual, just the story pages. Yeah. So the uh, the essential bits. Yeah, yeah, and that's yeah. So so check those out. We're going to be doing a series of 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 episodes of this. So this is episode one. Uh, don't not sure exactly how many it'll end up being, but we're gonna try to cover all fifty. So it maybe end up being like this. May be like part one of like a ten part series or like an eight part series. I don't really know, but we're gonna have fun. We're gonna discover it, and uh, hopefully uh, you guys enjoy it as well. So Action Force number one, a fantastic cover. It's got Flint, Lady J with just a J, no A Y E, and Footloose. Do we know the cover artist on this? Yeah, it's um, it's Jeff Senior. Oh, okay, Jeff Senior, G E O F F, correct? 
G E O F S. Yes, yes. And we've seen his stuff. He did some of the work in uh, some of those annuals too, I believe. Yes. Yeah. That I know that name. It's great. Like it's it pops with color. It looks like something that would be on a um, uh, actually on a, um, a box, a toy box, mm-hmm. because it's got that explosion. It's got the style of the explosion of the box on it. Yeah. Um, like you could see this if they did a three pack of these guys, that would be dynamite. You know, and I dig it. It's full color, only 32 pence. That's right. That's and, it. and the first issue came with the second issue for free. Number two presented free with this issue. Oh, so, so these were bundled together in a, in a, in a, in a plastic bag. That's right. On March 7th, 1987, for 32 pence, you got two issues of action. That's course. exciting. Yeah, you're right, because this is weekly. Yep. It doesn't just say the month. It actually has the week of, of publication. Now, do we know, and and you, you may not know this, is is that the week of release or is that the week they want you to pull it? Because you know how in America the month on there was when they want you. Do we know the difference? I I cannot confirm that specifically. But... I'll try to figure it out for next issue. Because okay. with all this stuff, a lot of, even when you talk to prof- like people who are working in this, it's all fuzzy. Yeah, you know, but we do know that at the time, the dates on the on the covers of the comics weren't the actual date of the release. They were about th- three to six months post dated of the release, and it told the vendor, you know, whether it's a newsstand or a Seven Eleven or what have you, what month or what week in this case to remove it off the shelf. So my question to this is 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 we we, we got to try to figure that out, and and we'll work on it. The reason I think that date might be the date it came out Uh was because they finally did, similar to how we had Postbox the Pit, they had a call for letters. And we didn't see any, you know, readers write in until issue six was the first time they printed the mail call. Uh And one of those answers to one of the reader's questions, um, I'm just going to give you this real quick, says... uh, when let's see when will we see new action force toys coming out along with you know because mm-hmm. they got a preview of action force weekly in the transformers comic in england and um that's what this was in response to but basically um they write back and they say um that the new action force toy range uh went on sale the first week in march oh so i'm guessing yeah that because this has a cover date of March 7th, 1987, it's the week that they launched the toys. I mean, if I was trying to make it all happen at the same time, and it seemed like it was planned out, yeah, that that is that accurate. That makes a ton of sense. Michael, that's why you're here. There you go. Doing the research, doing the good work. That's that's actually, that's it. That's And that's how so much of this stuff, I think, in, in, a, in, a, in a world where not everything was documented, is calculated. Um, when you when you look at some of the sites like 3D Joe's or you know uh, Carson will he'll put together things that people have said about creations of things and like this guy was pretty sure this happened then and that person that happened then if that's the case then they must have happened at the same time and that's what we just did here yeah that's fantastic so this was on the shelves March 7th 1987 yeah and even though issue 2 has a date of March uh, 14th 1987 just know on March 7th you know, yeah, they both were out there. They well, interesting. Jump, just jumping ahead real quickly. Uh, issue, uh, where did issue three go? Oh, yeah, out of order. There it is. I thought it, I thought they jumped an issue. Yeah, yeah so it'll be yeah, the twenty yeah. first. And then, perfect. So yeah. yeah, so here we go. Action Force. Uh, the story is called Gunboat, and this story is classic for me. This was classic uh, James Bond. Mission Impossible style adventure. Oh yeah, yeah. And and the funny thing is, I've since learned that they kind of had an edict, like for Marvel UK from mm-hmm. Hasbro, please focus on these characters. Okay. You know, as opposed to the ones we're focusing on in the states for GI Joe, like you won't find Duke in this book and yeah. that sort of thing. Please focus on these characters, and um, you know, so we can sell the toys. Yeah. And uh, yet they start out with a story where a number of these main characters, Lady J, Flint, are not in their outfits that match up with the toys so Mm -hmm. the fact that it is an undercover story and the characters it's very british to have this kind of story yeah but you know it's a little against the edict that hasro was like let's see these characters in their costumes right but (laughs) but uh, yes and the the, we also get shipwreck and and barbecue and uh footloose 
yes. which are not characters that got a lot of a lot of focus in the in the American version. So that makes complete sense. No, and and the funny thing is, you know, they give a little descriptor in this first issue, kind of of each individual. And you mentioned barbecue. He is he is dubbed the fire expert. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, as we read through the story, you know, in the states, we may know him as he puts out fires. Well. He, uh, not an not an action force. He doesn't. He's an incendiary guy <laughs> in action force, which is great. Yeah, he certainly is. Yeah, yeah. It, it really works. So they're on a. Uh, uh, it it opens with them on a uh, like a cruise yacht liner. It's Lady J J just with a J. They they they. Lay, I noticed in later issues they did give her the A Y E. Yes. Uh, but in this one, it's just Lady J and Flint. They're they're a little bit undercover, and then we flash back to this mission prep sequence where. In, in very Mission Impossible style, very James Bond style of James walking into the to the office of, of M and saying, "What's my mission?" Um, they're in a they're in a and and frankly, G.I. Joe did this too, but they're in a uh, they're they're in a uh, briefing room and Trent, Mister Trent, Mister Trent, who we've met uh, when we previously talked about the Action Force annuals, Trent is there and he's giving them the lowdown that basically they know Cobra's on this boat, they know there's a bunch of arms being smuggled on this boat. And uh, the problem is legitimate citizens were also invited on this boat. That's right. I feel like that's a purposeful decision by Cobra. Yeah. In other words, to give some collateral damage so that so if they get caught, they have a lot of hostages. Absolutely. And, and they're doing a big arms deal. So we get a we get a special mission force, per se, of, of Jay, Footloose, Flint, uh, Barbecue, and Shipwreck. Uh, Barbecue does have his helmet off in one scene and i think that's it for the rest of the book <laughs> yeah yeah uh and no poly no poly that i see with shipwreck i don't see any poly and i had to do a double take at first i thought is this claymore uh you know, oh yeah from, from special mission brazil you Could know be. Yeah. um he, he doesn't of, really look like footloose he's he's got yellow with brown camo yeah. yes so yeah a little different yeah yeah uh but he does have the sweet mustache mm-hmm. um and on the cover he's got the the sweet helmet He's got that sweet uh, gillied, I guess gilly helmet yep. would be would be the best way to phrase it. Uh, so we get a page and a half of that, and that's the other thing too with these uh, these action forces. They're not full length adventures. They're 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 briefer adventures. Page and a half of that, and then we're back to the back to the action on the boat. Um, this first adventure is eleven pages, and originally the goal was to have each one be eleven pages mm-hmm. um, because then they could put two together and then maybe eventually print them in the states for right. a twenty two page comic. Um, but after the first issue, you'll find out very quickly they didn't have the time, the resources to do, make it all happen. So they go down to five pages yeah. after were, this. Were these the ones that were reprinted as the European missions? No. So, yes, yes. Uh, not not in their entirety, but okay. a number of these stories were reprinted in what was first Action Force Monthly in the UK uh-huh. and then rebranded for GI Joe European missions in the United States. And that was a 15 issue run. Right. That was monthly, not weekly. Yeah. Um, that picked up in June of 1988. So after this action force weekly was canned and canceled, um, in the spring of 1988, they brought action force monthly back in the summer. And that was intended as much for an American audience as it was. Yeah the European yeah. audience. That's why Michael's here to drop this, drop this data, drop well, this I, research data that I, I have not done. I will say I am going through <laughs> these for the first time, but then what I'm using is just kind of a, a, a backup like source, uh, maybe dig into it a little bit more. Um, the total action force books. Oh that yeah. Brian yeah. Hickey and company put yep. out particularly volume two, which addresses this, um, you know, this era of, of the Marvel UK action force era. Um, is a good resource, good. Uh, both for the toys and also for the comics. And yeah. so, if you, you want to find those on, you can find absolutely find those on. They've done Kickstarters for them. You can find them online. You can get your copies of them. They're they're good looking books. Yeah, yeah. So that's that's a good yeah. you know. So um, one, the artwork in here is well, actually, so real quick, written by Simon Furman and drawn by Simon for, or yeah, draw, I'm sorry, drawn by Ken uh, Ken. Hopgood. Hopgood. Ke- yeah. Kev, Kev, Kev Hopgood. Hopgood. Right, right, right. Kev Hopgood, who we've seen his work on, on Action Force before as well. And written by Simon Furman. Now, Simon did pencils, I think, on some of the later stuff. And Hopgood did inks. Am I, did, did I read that? Uh, so so at miss... least for these first six issues, I can tell you that Kev Hopgood did all the pencils. And oh, Simon know... wrote the first yeah, three. Yeah, I'm sorry. And then Mike Collins wrote the four, five, and six. Total brain cramp. They do a... Uh, 
this and I and I'm willing to bet this is a European thing. They put that they put the slash there. Do you see that? Yep. So as an American reader, that for me that's a connector. Sure. So my brain was saying that Simon Furman was the penciler. Right. And I know Simon Furman's a writer. Right. But in the Larry Hama vein, I was like, oh, maybe he pencils as well. And maybe Kev Hopka did inks over his rough layouts or something. But yeah, so that that's interesting because they do the they do the dot dot dot, but then they also put in the they pulled Simon Furman from the Transformers yeah, team. He did a lot he, of work on Transformers. A lot on first in England and then obviously in the States. And yeah. so to kick off Action Force, they they said we need our, our heavy hitter Transformers, sure. you know, writer. And um And this issue plays out very much like an episode of the cartoon. Yeah. You know, it really is a mini adventure. Um I feel like every adventure on a boat that we've ever seen in any movie, film, or TV always involves uh people going in in disguise, mingling like normal. And then someone reveals something to get the party started sure. because you have to have enough time on a boat to get away from the dock. If there, if things were too obvious near the dock, you would never dare before then get out to sea. Yeah. So in this case, uh, we have a couple people, uh, bakers bringing a cake onto the boat and turns out those bakers are Cobra commander and Destro in disguise. Uh, and the cake itself is a, um, is that their that their weapons attaché? Oh, it's their no, money. It, it's their money. It it's, contains. Yeah. It contains. So this is a. It's yeah. It's a. It's an exchange between Destro and Cobra Commanders. So Destro is being paid for right. his services here. Yeah, for his services to deliver the the weapons. So Destro is bringing the weapons. The weapons are on the boat. Cobra Commander brings. They both brought. Really, they both brought the money on there. But he's not going to technically give it to him until they get the. Until because it's a little silly. Yeah. I'm giving you all this money, but we're also going on the boat together. I could have given you the money earlier. I know who you are. I know where you live. In fact, five issues later, we go to your castle. But we're going to do the exchange on the boat. Uh, And that's when we see that uh, while half the team is in disguise, the other half are just wearing their outfits, breaking into the boat. You think a disguise might help them, too, in case someone happened to look over. But instead, they see this garish, red-clad barbecue. That's right. (laughs) Who looks... But when I say garish... The artwork in here is stellar. The artwork is absolutely great. It's really Marvel, 80s Marvel. Yeah. Lots of great action. Um, the colors are, uh, I don't mean this in a bad way, they're very flat. Mm-hmm. So they're, you know, it's very old school coloring, but it's print, but the printing on it is not, um, it's better printing. It's a, it's a higher quality of print because they're on they're on the glossy paper. Yeah. So it look, has a different feel to it. It's kind of got a, 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 a bright, Flat a flat look, but it pops. It pops more if that's yeah. not too dis- dis- confusing of a description. I think you know because in these Action Force Weekly, they also have reprints of the Marvel yeah. GI Joe issues a bit to help flush them out. And I think the quality of these, because you'll start to see from the newsprint, you know, you, you see more of the yeah, some more of the 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 more and the the um. Well, I well I wonder if so. I, I think this looks a little better. Yeah, I agree, but I, I always wonder if they, uh, when I look at old reprints like that, if they if they took it from the original plates or if they take it from a you know like from a a, a, a nice Xerox basically of right. the of the original comic you know or picture of the comic. Um, that always is a question because sometimes you could tell they really do they're they're not getting it from a good source, um, but stuff goes south. There's a bunch of Cobra agents everywhere. Barbecue obviously is seen because yeah, of his because garish he's, outfit, yeah, he's, but, he's but just my favorite character, like a firefighting ninja, very quickly uh, <laughs> settles the score. Cause... He really does, yeah. And they, and they, what I like here, and and I, it's funny when you talk about like, there's no accidents in in art, art or at least comics because they know what they're drawing, right? They they make a choice to do it or not. So I guess it's the the they choose not to show him shooting. You just see him getting the guy getting hit, and they remember Action Force they kill people. Oh yeah, so you see this guy getting shot and killed, but you never see Shipwreck actually do it. Right. Whereas in in the United States, they might show him get Shipwreck shooting him, but you would you would get the guy going, "Ugh, my arm! I can't move my arm." Yeah. In Action Force, he's straight up murdering that man, and then you don't really realize it's Shipwreck until the next scene. So it's, it does take a little bit of the sting of the murder. Off shipwrecks' hands, so it's more violent yet less apparent at the same time. Exactly, it's it's that <laughs> it's that it's happening off screen, so it's happening more in your head, so it's more violent than you than you would imagine it. Yeah, 
So uh, as they're doing it, we meet a very important character for the next few years, uh, an errant eel. So Cobra, uh, G.I. Joe and Barbecue are not the only ones that are walking around in their full gear. There is a, a Cobra eel who has decided to not only just wear his eel outfit all over the board, but also uh, wear his helmet, too. Yeah. He's full on eeled. There's a few eels that show up, but this one dude is very important here because he comes into play. Um, it's all about the eels yeah. in these first, uh, you know, issues. And, and in order to drive people off the boat, the Joes set up some smoke bombs, but they're also setting up explosives as well. Mm-hmm. So they want to use the smoke bombs to get all the civilians off to scare them off the boat, and then they're just going to be left with the Cobra operatives because they don't exactly know all the Cobra operatives. They have to literally quote smoke them out. Yeah. So they do that. Uh, and while that's happening, Flint and Lady J still in disguise. They break down um, like the ship's captain. You see the, the ship's captain is dead. It looks like he's got an arrow or a, or a, harpoon, a harpoon harpoon sticking out of his back. Yeah. Uh, and and he Flint gets he gets cornered by Cobra Commander. And that's when we get introduced that also in the middle of all this stuff is Storm Shadow. And Storm Shadow shows up and he tells Cobra Commander... Uh, that there was a saboteur and he's talking about uh barbecue and he he neutralized barbecue but they really need to get off this boat yeah so we introduced to storm shadow uh cobra's plans are, are going awry now all of a sudden there's gunfire flint makes his move uh everyone escapes they escape on a nice a cobra moray which is sweet yeah that makes a guest appearance uh and while they're while the Joes are getting ready to jump off the boat, they escape. The boat explodes, and back on shore, you realize that Barbecue, while he was subdued by Storm Shadow, he says, "I set the charges. Yeah, I didn't trigger them." So the Joes don't know who actually exploded the boat. It's left up to a mystery: who primed them? Yeah. Do you have suspicions, Michael? I, I think I think Storm Shadow is already showing his turncoat colors uh, I think early on. So too, but we don't <laughs> we don't get an immediate answer to that. We do not get an immediate answer to that. Uh, also, in this book, there's a really cool uh, two page toys commercial spread that's done um, uh, fumetti style. So they use uh, they use real pictures of the toys and they lay some uh, comic book dialogue over it. The funny thing about this advertisement, because it appears in the all of these first six issues, uh-huh. it's the it's featuring primarily the dragonfly, right? And then it's got the fangs and the armadillo mini tank and the water moccasin, a um, few other characters such as Bazooka, Wild Bill. None of these appear in any of these first six issues, with the mm-hmm. exception of the fang finally makes an appearance. Um, in one of the G.I. Joe reprints mm-hmm. a little later on. So I just think it's funny that, you know, uh, if they really wanted to sell this dragonfly, and boy, are they pumping it in the advert, yep. that they might have chose to put it in one of the stories early on here within the first month and a half of Action Force Weekly. But uh, it's funny to me that, uh, you know, it's 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 not. I, I was talking about There's earlier. There's only so much coordination. I think they could achieve. I know. Yeah. yeah so. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So. But yeah. But they look. They got Dreadnoks though. Dreadnoks eventually show up too. Yep. Yeah. Um. And then we get a little a breakdown of a little profile on Flint, and then we've got the um the yeah, best and, defense, uh, which was the the reprint, a uh, special force, special missions reprint from this, that that preview, uh, special more special missions preview that we got. Um, and, and for the eagle-eyed listeners out there, the intelligence profile, Flint, um, and they did this with a number of Action Force characters, of course. They're not, they're, their birthplaces are from other places. It's international, so yeah. they're from all around the world. So, you know, in this case... Flint's from London. Flint's from Lincoln, England. And, uh, Link, and, is it Lincoln? Oh, Lincoln. it is Lincoln. Oh, my gosh, my eyes are... Uh, man, I'm blind. But instead of, <laughs> you know, we'll all know, we traditionally know Flint as Dashiel uh-huh. uh, Fairborn, and his name's been changed to David Fairborn. And he also, he, they dropped an E. Mm-hmm. Isn't Fairborn in, in uh, Fairborn here is spelled with an E at the end? I think you're right, yeah. 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 Interesting tweaks. But, Interesting uh, tweaks. But yeah, he's so, yeah. He, but he British. Looks, I mean, yeah, he's British, and he looks British. Mm-hmm. So that's it. Uh, in the back, you get some sweet Thundercats crispy bacon flavor potato snacks ads on the very back of this with some glitter stickers as well. I want some Thundercats crispy bacon flavored potato snacks. Like they actually, that sounds amazing. And they're Thundercat styles from Sooner Foods. There you go. Now, 
Joe, at the top of this, um, you know, there was a mail call. Um, mail call. And like I said, we don't see any uh, listener or reader responses until issue six, but they do pose the three questions. They say, you know, which story did you prefer? You know, who is your favorite Action Force character and who would you like to see more of? So after one issue, um, yeah. do you have any sense of, you know, well, obviously, I think you're more interested in the story we mostly just talked about, which was the original story, right? As opposed to the G.I. Joe reprint story. Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The reprints, are, there, there are some differences in there that uh, you identified as you were going over. And, uh, we don't have that kind of time. Yeah, yeah, exactly, <laughs> exactly. Uh, but, but yeah, no, I guess, really, I guess I'll just really, say. Yeah, I'm really interested in the Action Force stuff. Um, do you have a, do you have a, in that first story, that do you have a story, favorite character based on well, what limited? Yeah, you know, uh, th- well, once again, I think they, they underplay Shipwreck. I think Shipwreck, while he's there, doesn't have anything quality to do. He's the one American, by the way. If you look at all their birthplaces, if you research yeah, it, yeah. you know he's he's he is still from the states. Yeah, okay, well that so. makes sense. Okay. They, they, England doesn't want to claim <laughs> Shipwreck. Uh, that makes sense that they wouldn't. Um, I think I think uh, uh, probably uh, probably Flint. Sure, you know, just because he's that lead, he, he seems to be the lead guy. Although, you know, I want to I want to know more about Trent. My oh. my favorite character was Shipwreck because he's the one that saved Barbecue's butt there. That's true. You know, yeah, uh, yeah, and, he's, and yeah. He's got a kill count. He was responsible for the kill. Yeah, yeah. He's got a kill count. No, you're <laughs> you're not you're not wrong. Uh, so we move on to uh, the second issue, issue number two. This is March fourteenth, nineteen eighty seven, and a fantastic cover, very Mike Zekian. It's, but also by Jeff Senior. But also by Jeff Senior. But it's very. It, it feels like those like it fits right alongside those classic Mike Zek Snake Eyes Storm Shadow covers. Um, it's Snake Eyes walking down a hallway with Scarlet, and they're they're in pursuit of an eel, and the eel is about to ambush them. Um, this is a gorgeous, this is a gorgeous cover. Yeah, uh, I really enjoy the pop of the eel's hand over the force, the word action force. That looks really great. Um, the colors are vibrant. Snake Eyes looks great. Scarlet looks awesome. Um, like there's everything about. I don't like the yellow on the eel. Even in the comic, they color the 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 Culver insignia yellow. Yeah. Um, I'm trying to remember on the toy was it was it black or gray? Uh, it was a combination of black and red, right? Uh, I think I think wasn't the the Cobra logo black on red? Yeah, I think so. Yeah, because he had he had a red vet. Yeah, I mean, we could, we could look it up. We could just literally look at a Neil toy, but um, yeah, I don't like the yellow. I don't think that that doesn't work for me. Yeah. Um, but it is yellow throughout. But as far as the rendering though. Looks great. Looks funny, very toyetic. Funny thing I noticed, so cross, um, Scarlet does not have her crossbow here, but on issue one, if you looked at Lady J, she was donning a crossbow. So uh, at some point, Lady J stole Scarlet's crossbow. Nice. <laughs> um, I'm going to settle this real quick. Uh, yeah. Oh, yeah. It's silver. Cobra Eel is, oh, it is silver. silver. Yeah, it's a silver, silver, light gray, or, you know, silverish. On red. Uh, Cobra logo on the red, on the red chest piece. Yeah. So, yeah, that works a lot better. And it's crazy because they they use the silver for like highlights. You know, he's got silvery uh, um, shoulder pads, um, but maybe it just didn't render, or maybe the printing process at the time wasn't reliable to do something like you know that intricate. And I love this too because anytime a cover calls to what's about to happen in the issue, um, that's it for me. I've yeah. said that on the show many times. <laughs> I love it. I love covers need to represent what's happening in there if they're just representational covers. Like the issue, first issue one, it was it was it was the dudes involved in this story, but it was representational. It was just them exploding, but that works for a number one issue. It ties you to the toy. In this case, now we're telling a story, and here's the story. Yeah. Um. And the so we had in the um. Uh. In the first issue, so this is the second. Sorry, so this is the second issue that was complimentary. Was, com- was complimentary with yeah. the first issue. Yep. Um. We had the it was the first half of the first special mission force ish, adventure. So in this second issue, they split up the new adventure, a few pages of the new adventure, and then they give you the special missions adventure. Yeah. So so what you're referring to it actually it's the it was a GI Joe story from GI Joe issue fifty. Right. And it was the in the United States it was the preview of special story missions, of right. special missions the series that was to come. Correct. And so, yeah, they split it into two between. Two. And so we get a very brief story of 
the G of the action force stuff in this. Yeah. And actually, so, so I had said in issue one, uh, the new content for us was 11 pages mm -hmm. here. It's down to five. Right. And every issue going forward, it's five pages. Yeah. So, so, so uh, it's very brief and, um, lots of two parters, but that's what you want in a weekly book because you want, you keep, want that. It's a cliffhanger. It's a serial. It's gotta a, keep coming back. I got to come back next week for it. So mm -hmm. it's very smart to do it. So we are introduced to Scarlet and Snake Eyes. And we're, they say that they're the, uh, they are American members. Yeah. So they're not changing them at all. So I can assume you, in my head canon, these are the Scarlet and Snake Eyes that we know and love. They're on the London Underground track. London Underground doing a very Superman the movie, Otis <laughs> entrance into the G.I. Joe or the Action Force headquarters. One of my favorite things unique to this issue and this page, uh -huh. on the very left side of this image, there's a warning, and it says, Scarlet and Snake Eyes are highly trained Action Force personnel on no, all caps, no account should you play on London Underground tracks. Yes. Keeping the kids safe, and now they know. <laughs> That's so good. I love and it. And it's so good. And it's true. And so they, just like in Superman the movie, they go into a little alcove and the door slides open. And all of a sudden, they're in the uh, they're in the Action Force headquarters. And uh, Flint is narrating this whole issue. Yeah. Uh, I will say right this. To Trent. This transition from them going to this headquarters and them being in this um, uh, uh, like shooting gallery training mission is one of the most awkwardly handled transitions. I had to read it four times to understand what was happening. It's, it's like the danger room in X-Men. Right, all of a but sudden. they never say that. Right. They, they all, it says uh, uh, something like uh, we've... We, we know the they're in the London base. They talk about some yeah. of the improvements we've made. They don't actually say we've got a, we've got a room. I, at the very bottom, it says, uh, my mentioning the addition of the Simcom room could well be seen as an error. That's presuming we know what the Simcom room is. Yep. I didn't know what the Simcom room was. <laughs> I don't know. I don't. That doesn't scream to have a definition associated. I guess simulation combat, combat. Of course. I guess that's what right? it is. Yeah. <laughs> um. So 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 that was a little jarring. Yeah. What it is is. Uh, they captured an eel from that previous mission, and they have him at this base. But while that eel is, uh, they think he's under safely under lock and key, which is what Snake Eyes and Scarlet are here to talk to him about. He he breaks free. Does he murder Footloose there, or is he just because he has a knife in his hand? And Action Force is here for murdering people. Uh, but there is a. It we, appears we, to be Footloose, right? Because he's got a mustache. We do not see Footloose in the next four issues after this. So um, he might have murdered Footloose. To be determined. Yeah, um, <laughs> I, it looks like there's a mustache there. It's he's a, kind of in shadow. To be fair, it might just be a, 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 another dude in, in fatigues. I don't know, but the eel has escaped. They don't know that. We know that. Um, we then and this is either an eel or it's Duke in disguise because he looks an yeah, awful lot he does. like Duke here. very much like Duke. <laughs> so this final panel, Flint's like, "You want to use it now?" And I'm going, "Use what now? What is what is we talking about?" And she says, "Listen, Flint, Snake Eyes and I need regular training to keep our ninja skills honed to peak perfection. We're only talking simulated combat here, and so hence we get this little mini danger room adventure." Uh, once you wrap your head around what's actually happening, it's very fun. Yeah. Yeah. Um, nice illustrations. The eel, luckily, all the all the combat models they have in the simulation room are other eels. If he had gone into like a Crimson Guard simulation, he would have stood out. And and how convenient is it that the river running through this simulation combat environment is actually attached to the Thames River in London? So totally, just you know, it's, you know they're they're probably very close to MI six. Yeah. Um, there's I also like that there's arrows on the floor to tell in the simulated combat room which way to go because as proper soldiers, I guess you would need that, you know. Um, so there's a bunch of robotic like dummies eels set up, and that's what Scarlet and Snake Eyes are are going to, to come across. And very much like the danger room, Flint's up in his room and he's he's you know pulling pulling levers and I'm sorry levers, and these fake eels are popping up, and Scarlet and Snake Eyes are are taking them out as they go, until they finally meet one at the very end. Uh, 
that catches Snake Eyes by surprise. Gives him a nice little whack on the noggin and uh, makes his escape. He shoots Scarlet in the arm with a with with a, a har- torpedo or harpoon, harpoon bolt. Again. Harpoon bolt. Yeah, another yeah. harpoon. Snake Eyes is knocked out. And Flint realizes that he's watching this all on camera and he says their their only chance might be now that this eel is is escaping is to follow this eel home to their headquarters. And that's it. That's that's all the new action force you get for issue number two. Uh, I've got the rest of the reprint issue. And then at the back, we were talking briefly, uh, it's got a little nod to what they did in some of the early battle action force stuff, which was a totally separate continuity, totally separate, continuity, totally separate publisher, but they would, they would include other military stories as well that weren't related to GI Joe action force, Cobra blood for the, ba- none of the, you know, none of that stuff, just a military story. And we've got a, a sweet little first part of a six, six, five pages of a part one of two of a story called my brother's keeper. And it's by Ken Stacy who is a lovely illustrator painted. He did a lot of really cool painted stuff back in the day. So I think he's still operating in mm-hmm. some capacity, really lush stuff, very animated style. Very, uh, I imagine Bruce Tim was influenced by this stuff. He's, he's probably like one generation older than Tim. Yeah. I think. Well, no, because Batman, the animates no, no, he's, he's a contemporary with Tim. Oh yeah. Yeah. He totally would be. Yeah. Because animated series was being, in the works right around now mm-hmm. and Bruce Tim style was all that. So yeah, we had kind of a contemporary, so, but the, you know what it is? It's, um, uh, space ghost. Um, Oh, the, the, uh, they're all influenced by the guy who did space ghost animation. Why can't I think of his name? He did a little bit of comics work. Sorry. Yeah. You guys are, you guys, I know, I know Dave Amit right now is screaming. Dave. <laughs> um, but yeah, this story, you know, it's a 1955 period piece and uh, features two experimental aircraft, one of which this flying wing uh, uh, was instrumental in the eventual development of the B-2 bomber, the stealth bomber in uh, in the 80s and uh, early 90s, I guess. So that's kind of cool. And um, yeah, I actually, I actually enjoyed this little story. Yeah, it's fun. Mm-hmm. Um, totally not. Alex Toth. That's oh, what I'm right. thinking of. That's right. what I'm Yeah, sorry, guys. I had total brain crap. Yeah, very Alex Tothy, I think. That's why I, that's the influences I see. So I love Ken Stacy. Uh, but this is this is uh this is Joe Nye loves Action Force, not Joe Nye loves Kevin <laughs> Stacy. Um so No we, Thundercats advert no, on the back. Or, of no, that yeah, one. no Thundercats <laughs> advert. Would we get, they print um, the story on the back. Yeah, the story on the back, which is that's another thing that they used to do a lot with these. Yeah. Is uh where the US were like kind of adamant about front and back covers being ad spaces and stuff. This yeah. is story on the back. They're all 24 pages and they yep. number every page, whether there's an advertisement yep. or some ancillary material, it, it, you know, it's a page. Yeah. So. so moving on to issue number three, Flint on the cover saying that action force needs you very much like the uncle Sam needs you to recruit. Another Jeff Sr. cover. Another Jeff Sr. And cover. And that image, I would say, is one of the most utilized images in most action force like marketing material that I see. You'll, yeah. you'll see it in various places when they're asking you to write in letters, and they'll reprint this image a lot. Yeah, very much so. So it says, Jeff Sr., a regular printed... Uh, th- this was an image that Jeff Sr. drew. Oh, And it was part of their recruiting him uh, got into it. So joining it's just, their it's, team. It's what, it's what uh, drew him to the book. Or drew... drew Drew them to his art yes. work on the book. Got yep. it. Because I saw it, and usually this on this inside cover, that's something like it's a preview of something that. I, and it, I and my sure brain it was went fan art or what? Yeah, yeah, and I was like, oh, are they gonna go to like a comic convention in this or something? And then it never happened. And yeah. yeah. So um, they're they're promoting Marvel UK because again, Action Force is yeah, new to Marvel UK, totally. so they're they're using totally some other. It, they do a great job with cross promoting all, all the stuff, whether it's the toys or the Marvel stuff. Yeah. 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 Um, so we get run to ground. So the action picks up pretty much right after that eel escaped from the uh, the Action Force headquarters. And he comes out of a sewer in London, and he meets immediately with the, the London punk scene. Yeah, these are not the Dreadnoughts. No, but, not but... the Dreadnoughts at all. Um, <laughs> I would say I would say London punk scene for probably, this is so this is 1987, yeah. probably about from seven years earlier. Yeah. So these are London punks that you, that you would imagine in the er, very early 80s, not so much, I think, around 87. I think Zoran's cousin is in there. But... They look great, though. <laughs> 
<laughs> they absolutely look great. They got there. We got they they should be dreadnoughts. They've got mohawks. They've got uh, leopard print plant pants. He's absolutely a member of Tiger Force. Oh yeah, that dude in the middle. He's got tiger pants on. Yeah, and a fan um, of the Punisher. Yeah, yeah fan of the Punisher. Uh, <laughs> fan of leather, chrome. So they attack him. They do an old like the. Uh, it's it's very much like the Terminator. Like you know uh, when. Uh, in the first movie, they whip out the, the switchblade and Schwarzenegger's naked, and it's oh, what's yeah. his name? Um, the actor who passed away uh, from t- everything. He did everything with James Cameron. Um, man, blanking on names today. Anyway, but it's that scene. It's a bunch of punks saying to the Terminator, you know, we're going to mess you up, but it's an eel this time, and the eel proceeds to wipe the floor with him. Um, very, this eel is the kind of a guy that, I would expect him to show up later as like super eel. He's, you know, I was saying, who's your favorite character? You know, in this issue, this is my favorite character. He's great. This eel yeah, is he's like great. legit. <laughs> he's really great. Like the, um, uh, he should have been like Scarface. Remember Scarface? Yeah. In the, in the G- uh, not, not Scarface, Scarface, but the, the G.I. Joe guy. So yep. he was a regular the Cobra Trooper. Yeah, he was yeah. a regular Cobra Trooper, but he had a very, that's what's happening with this eel. I'm loving him because he's super talented, beats the crap out of these four punks. Steals portions of all their clothing, so now he's disguised. He's wearing the Tiger Force pants. Um, and uh, I guess we don't have to point it out too closely, but on page five in the upper right, there's something that's a bit risque happening art-wise. With- oh, boy. <laughs> there's some naked punks. Yeah, well, he took his pants off. Yep. So know. he's got no pants. What can I say? And uh, Flint and Snake Eyes, th- by the time they show up here, the the punks are still unconscious, meaning he may have killed them. And he left, and he took all their clothing, and, and and oh no, this guy's getting away. So he's he's apparently he survived. So the eel has uh, uh he's kinder than 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 shipwreck, but he's he's now wants to be a member of Tiger Force too. He really he wants to be a member pants. of Tiger Force. Those pants are great, <laughs> and they're and uh, out outbacks looking at that, going, I've got an idea for something. That's right. I think I could do it. Snake Eyes, by the way, rendered wonderfully. Yeah, yeah. It's his V two look. And he's got all the right belts and all the right places. Everything looks great. I mean, uh, the, all the rendering is really solid. There's nice shadow work. It's very much the 80s Marvel style of, you know, quasi-realism, um, you know, musculatures that are normal looking. They're not overly exaggerated. They're not superhero-y. They're very much um, what would real people, you know, well, it fit real people, but what would real people look like doing this stuff? Yeah, and that version of Snake Eyes, again, so this is 1987, but in England, everything was about two years delayed. So mm-hmm. that whole 1985 run of action figures yeah. is where they're pulling a lot of the yes. designs from. So they realize that the uh, the eel has gotten on a double-decker bus with a Transformers advertisement on it. Yep, cross-promotion. Um, yep, they're in a Silver Mirage Jeep chasing him. Um, I like that it's reversed. Yeah, because they're in England. Yep, that's right. Because if memory serves, right, the Silver Mirage had side this, had on sidecar right. on the other side. Yep. This time yep. it's on the other side. The left, yeah. The, and Snake Eyes is driving because Snake Eyes would never ride would never ride sidecar nope. in a, in a Silver Mirage. Um, I do like that they're openly packing Uzis. Yep, in yep. the streets of London. Uh, and they see they 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 chase this tight now Tiger Force looking Cobra eel. Uh, he runs into a, a tasty burger, which is, you know, think of McDonald's big belly burger kind of thing. Um, and it turns out in the back of the tasty burger, the whole thing seems to be a Cobra front. Yeah. Is that the vibe you got? Well, they're on top of the building now. Yeah. So. But that's the vibe you got, right? Yeah. Like it's the yeah. reason he's key because he just walks past the guy. Yep. There's no stopping him. Yeah. It's, uh, it's the London version of Springfield. Yeah, right? exactly. Mm-hmm. And on the rooftop is one of those uh, giant Cobra helicopters that transported everything that never properly got a name, right? Yeah. Now they're calling it the Aspid. Uh, is that? Compliments of IDW and very recent well, G.I. Joe history. Well, it needs a name. It needs a name. It, should, so, it always needs so a name. So now I would refer to this as the Cobra Aspid. Yeah. But uh, but yes, in, yeah. in this era, it did not have a name. But it's a great shot. It's a wonderful shot. I mean, this panel yeah. is amazing. And Snake Eyes, uh, it's, very, it's very quick. The, the economy of story telling this by the way is fantastic in five pages they cover a lot of ground uh it's they tell the story that it it is absolutely helped by that um narration by flint so that helps cover a lot of the oh and then this happened but it's still really well done visually and that you can really follow what's happening and in this case snake eyes uh is faster than flint he gets to this helicopter or actually he's the only one in pursuit flint's staying staying back and back up and snake eyes goes to the helicopter and then 
disappears. So Flint assumes he's hiding on the helicopter. We assume he's hiding on the helicopter. We actually don't get any confirmation of that. It's just that uh, Flint is on the roof, and he doesn't know where Snake Eyes went. And we get a little flash of Destro and Cobra Commander. Yep, they're flying the helicopter again because they have to do everything around here. That's right. If you want a job done right, you got to do it yourself, guys. Uh, this does come packed with a awesome poster. Yeah, um, it's still and, stapled in here. Yeah, but... it's still stapled in, and it does appear to be the poster of the cover, which is Action Force Needs You, which would make a dynamite poster to hang on a wall. So, li- listeners, if, you, if you're if you going to get one issue of Action Force, get issue three mm-hmm. and make sure it comes with the poster in it and get that poster framed because that is a good-looking poster. They've got all kinds of freebies. Issue one came with issue two. Issue three comes with a free poster. Yeah, and then we get the second half of the Ken Stacy show story, uh, you know, some betrayal in the sky. Some uh, and it know, was a Russian spy that they had to neutralize. Russian spy the whole time, and he had to overcome childhood trauma, as all good military stories do. Uh, so now we've got we're on issue four of Action Force here, and boy howdy, they don't like they're not they're not wasting any time. The cover is the cover of J. Joe thirty five. It's the dogfight issue. 34. 34, rather. Sorry. It's the dogfight issue. Mike Zek. Mike Zek. Uh, recolored, but Re- yeah. same artwork. Same artwork because this issue is part one of the reprint of, or it was, no, sorry. Last issue was part one of the reprint of the dogfight, the the uh, ace wild weasel dogfight, which is an amazing uh, shakedown. That's the name of the story. Yeah, so what they've done is they've taken the G.I. Joe reprint part two and they've made it the headline story for this issue. Right. So And the, why wouldn't you? I mean it's one of the all time great stories. Yeah. That doesn't get enough love. Uh as much as we do love it. Everyone likes to talk about twenty one and all that, you know. No Shakedown is one of the great stories of all time. Uh really well told. Oh, and as an Irish citizen, I have to mention that Lady J in this universe is Irish. Oh, okay. So, uh, You're an so Irish citizen? I am, yeah. What? US and Irish, but nice. Yeah. So yeah, so we get the 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 primary hook of this is the part two of Shakedown. We all know how great that story is. Um, does, do they have her speak with like a brogue? No, they, they you know throw, you know like they throw the. But if you got the toy, you know, and you got the yeah. Action Force file card, you know, it makes sense because she's super green. Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? Like the, it, that's a no brainer. Yeah, like yeah, you just, just see see she's wearing shamrock colors. So you flip all past that, you get the advertisement, the same one for uh, the uh, dragonfly in the middle. And then we get to Coils of the Serpent. And I think this is my favorite story of these first six issues. Mm-hmm. I think I think this one resonated the most with oh, me. okay. Just because of the crossover uh, from, it feels, like I read this and I was like, have I read this before? Because I've seen many of these locations, of course, in yeah. the G.I. Joe comics. And it just feels like, it's it's just a great, it's a short story, but it's great. It's solid. And it and it is, it's using the Destro Silent Castle. So it's using stuff we've seen before. There's no reason really it can't take place in the same continuity. We're you know? in the Balkans. Yeah, we're know? in the Balkans. Um, it, it it moves, it picks up uh, right after the, the previous one. So the helicopter lands and, and Snake Eyes is on the helicopter. There's a very small drawing of him. You can see him sneaking off the back. Yeah, and so they, if you look close, you can see where he's at. They go so far because it is so subtle. Yeah, they do literally spell it out. Unheralded, for you. unnoticed, final passenger leaves the helicopter. Yeah, his name is Snake Eyes. So this is um, I, I also got the vibe of this one, obviously of of the, you know, snake any any Snake Eyes on the move mission, but that always makes me think of Wolverine in the sewers. Yeah, it's just so good. Um, so Snake Eyes is working his way through the Silent Castle. He's straight up murdering fools too. Uh, and now we finally meet the Baroness, and we get high court drama of the highest order from the Cobra High Command. Um, I love it. Mm-hmm. I'm here for it. This splash page of Cobra Commander's vision of what the world will look like when they when they run the world is fantastic. Uh, we should point out that this new issue is actually written by Mike Collins. And pencils, uh, Kev Hopgood once again. So now Mike Collins has taken over the storytelling. This spread is Mike. Can, Michael, can you describe that for us? Yeah, I mean, it's it's to me, it's it's the height of Nazi Germany. <laughs> it really. Is. I mean, it is. You it know, really is. we've got the banners that instead of swastikas, we've got the you know the Cobra logo, and um, yeah, just city it, of flame. 
uh, giant like a you know instead of a, a mushroom cloud you have this this giant snake image in the sky that's just about <laughs> ready this to... where the producers of the snake ice movie got the idea yeah 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 uh it's awesome like it is absolutely out of a world war ii story there's you know like you up close near the camera you got a couple culver soldiers that kind of frame it for you you've got people marching um you know captured like citizens captured by cobra the city's in rubble this is this is and, and imagine this coming out in London, a city that absolutely still you know, resonated with the effects of that, just you know, a generation earlier. So this this is this is a powerful image. I think more powerful to to the the readers of Action Force than it would have been to like to our eyes. You've this got is, Big Ben with a yeah, cobra, you know, yeah, banner all just, over it. Like the whole idea of of war at your home isn't something that sat with a, a you know a kid in the suburbs of Chicago. You know. Like Whereas a, in London, they were living amongst these buildings that were bombed out. Yeah, you know, had been rebuilt, obviously, but there, there still are scars, and still, you know, there still are places uh, that they all live about. That oh yeah, that building was bombed out, out you know, over the hill over there. They just let it rot. You know, like that's that's a that's was a fact of life in all of Europe after World War II. Yeah. So this is a really powerful image to use in this book. I would love to see this colored again. Mm. With a little bit more, you know, subtlety. Uh huh. Um, I'd love to see, honestly, the pencil art. Yeah. For this, this or the yeah. It's it's really good. It's really good. Uh, and then we get more ranting. So it's it's Cobra Commander talking about, you know, his plans for world domination, and Destro and the Baroness. We see. It it's that complicated relationship that Destro has with Cobra and Cobra Commander. Of yeah, I'm going to work with you, but I also think you're a fool. And I could do the job better. Yeah. So he's I mean, kind of laying his plan out that I'm going to take this thing over. He doesn't mince words. I yeah. mean, as soon as the commander leaves the room, I mean, he puts it he puts it straight out there. Yeah. I mean, he's got a whole chess set dedicated to it. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. He really does. Uh, I'm always here for a Destro chess game. Always. As soon as I see a Destro chess game, I get excited. I mean... Here's Destro taking a figure of the commander. Uh huh. Popping its head off. Flicking his head off like a dandelion, you yep. know. Dispose of it without a thought. Totally. And when that happens, after we get that uh, uh, two page. And it, what, what I liked about this is we talk about economy of storytelling, and th they only have five pages and they, they, they move pretty fast. They spent a lot of time on that emotion. They spent a lot of, they spent two and a half pages explaining what Cobra Commander wants, why Destro thinks he's a fool, and, and what Destro's plans are. And then we cut back to some of the action, and we get we see Snake Eyes once again uh, cutting his way through the castle, and he uh, interrupts Cobra Commander on the toilet, I feel like. That's what's happening in here. <laughs> As Cobra Commander screams to get call for the Dreadnoughts. Yeah, so basically, uh, Cobra Commander is alerted that um, Snake Eyes has cut through a no, number of Cobra you know Troopers. Funny? I thought that was Snake Eyes. No, it's not so because it's, he's got a little bit of a sash on. But you can no, it's see not. in the panel before. So this one guy gets away. So this actually has the highest kill count of of any issue thus far. Yeah, Four yeah. Cobra Troopers are yeah. mowed down uh, by Snake Eyes and his Uzi here, but uh, but one gets away, and so Snake Eyes has to turn tail. What's interesting? So so let's think of this then, because I'm reading this thinking, well, Snake Eyes, he's yes, he's he hides on the helicopter. Because he's going to find out, I guess, where their base is. That's what they were essentially doing last issue. But when he gets there, he makes his way through the castle to murder everyone. He could have just escaped. That's true. You know what I'm saying? He could have just climbed. If his goal is not to... That's why I thought it was Snake Eyes there. If his goal was not to go in and you know, kill some people mm -hmm. and stop Cobra Command or get him or kidnap him or whatever you're going to do, he's essentially just getting out. Yeah. So he rode the he rode the helicopter to then escape. Maybe he didn't know that the commander and Destro were the ones in the cockpit of the helicopter. That's a good point. Because he might have, you know, acted a little bit differently. Hey, I'm not second guessing Snake Eyes. I'm just <laughs> saying I'm trying to understand what's going on here because he's so quiet and so mysterious. He just never shares his inner thoughts. The only thing I wanted to mention real quick at the beginning of these issues, there's this mission control and they give you a lot of information. Mm -hmm. And so one thing they do is they tease in issue three. The uh, what they're going to have in starting in issue four is this new TAC page, uh -huh. which is the technical arms compendium page. Exciting. And it says in the next issue, um, uh, we're going to feature 
Ace, Bazooka, Footloose, Heavy Metal, and Wild Bill all talking about, you know, G.I. Joe equipment and vehicles. Mm-hmm. And so we're going to feature the Sky Striker and the M16 and M203 grenade launcher. And they say that we're going to see Ace, Bazooka, Footloose, Heavy Metal, that and Wild happens. Bill. But in the end, well, you'll see here in issue f- um, issue five, rather, sorry, um, that uh, Ace and Footloose are there so wild bill couldn't show up wild bill couldn't show Steeler up Steeler couldn't show up heavy metal heavy metal rather. bazooka yeah they, so uh yeah. so maybe we'll see them in the future but not in issue five so, so on to issue five they, they don't waste any time with the dread with getting to the dreadnoughts this cover is amazing it is it's ripper and buzzer uh buzzer's got his buzz saw yeah tearing through the front cover they're both on motorcycles in the snow which is awesome. And it says Dreadnought Rampage. Dreadnought Rampage. Exclamation points are all over these titles, by the way. So many exclamation it's points. Great. Um, it, this is really a great drawing. Like, I love it. It's awesome. The colors are nice. They, uh, they, there's nice compliments because there's, there could be a lot of blue here that could blend in, you know, because you've got sky, you've got blue accents on the metal and on the blue jeans and stuff. They've found a way to make everything pop with the flesh and the yellow shirts and the blonde hair um, and the green shirt there. Like it's everything works well, I think. And uh, just to bring it forward uh, to the G.I. Joe classified of modern day, uh, once again, Torch is nowhere to be found yeah. or seen. <laughs> and uh, there is a promotional image of the Dreadnoughts in here that uh-huh. has Torch, but he uh, he clearly is uh, the third wheel. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, he's 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 always I, he always joked he was more chill. There you go. He really did. Uh, you know, uh, buzzer buzzer was always kind of like want to be the leader, and then uh, Ripper was always just like the the like the bag man, the most dangerous. Yeah, Ripper's like yeah, like Ripper was like he's the real criminal. Yeah, he was like the savage. Yeah, buzzer was like the 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 quote unquote brains of the operation. You know, he would always think overthink it. And then, and then Torch was always just like this old hippie who liked to blow things up and light them on fire, you know. Yeah. Like, like I, I got a metal, sh- I got a concert to get to. I got, there, I got, a, I got a practice for cold slither. Don't get in my way. It is funny before they start the story in Mission Control, they do a little preview of what we're going to see in the Dreadnoughts, and they do refer to Buzzer as Buzz Saw. Oh yeah. And uh, in the story, they get it right. You know, yeah. in the dialogue, it's Buzzer. But then again, in this promotional image of it's like a pinup of the three dreadnoughts, uh, and it's Buzzsaw once again. You'll see. Interesting. Um, I to this day I've said this before. I've always had trouble keeping Buzzer and Ripper separate in my head as far as names. Mm-hmm. And to this day, to this literal moment, I always have to say Buzzer Blonde. So as we were <laughs> literally talking about it, now, if you heard any hesitation, that's because my brain was going Buzzer Blonde, Buzzer Blonde. Yeah, that's. Just torch. I was torch is torch. I get torch, but buzzer and ripper. I've always confused, and I will never not confuse them. Um, but so there. Now this is super James Bond. Snake eyes on skis through the Alps. They're on motorcycles. Not they. They don't seem modified except there are spikes on the wheels. Yeah. So they do draw the spikes on the wheels, but like there's no skis. There's no like half half ski half. It is straight up. Spiked wheeled motorcycles. And it is daytime. So the filmmaker in me is like, well, we just left Snake Eyes at nighttime in the right. castle. Right. They arrived. Obviously, that was the evening before. So this is like next morning. Yeah. Day for night. That's right. Yeah. Uh where did he get the skis? Is he wearing ski boots? How is her how are his ankles not snapping? You know what I'm saying? It's these Snake are, Eyes, man. These are the questions I always ask whenever I see stuff like this. When like James <laughs> Bond will just pop on a pair of skis. I go, How do your ankles not break, James? You're not putting on ski boots. Like it just doesn't make any sense. But it is an awesome chase down the mountain. At one point, Buzzer literally takes his diamond studded chainsaw and he cuts an entire tree in half. Yeah. And he screams timber now at this moment now of course there's no wolf in this story yeah yeah yeah. but we know the action figure came with the wolf even in england uh-huh. and so i to me it would have been so funny if, if you know at that point that's when he met his wolf yes a wolf comes wolf was living in the tree <laughs> jumps out of the trees like who destroyed my house and snake guys catches him and is like come live with me and it's the wolf's like all right let's do this and buzzer posthumously gets credit for naming snake yeah. guys as wolf um it the it's also like he cuts through that tree so fast and it, they're actually then 
somehow ahead of Snake Eyes. You know what I mean? Like there's weird. It's it's a very. I guess they're above him. They're not ahead of him. They're above him. So Snake Eyes went around a bend. They went up top, cut the tree down as Snake Eyes came around. That's what's actually happening. As Snake Eyes is coming around this this you know jump that they didn't do. That's when the tree falls, and then Snake Eyes has to make a jump over that tree. And as he makes the jump, they're actually able to shoot him in the arm. Yeah, that's two arm shots on two both two ninjas in you know within three issues. That's right. Yeah, that's that's a lot of arm ninja action. Uh, doesn't stop Snake Eyes though. He still keeps making his way towards the uh, towards this uh, town that the the bottom of the ski slope would. <laughs> would be host to yeah but now he's now we have real blood real so blood. he's leaving a trail of blood for the dreadnoughts to follow yep uh and assuming because they didn't do the same like ski jump ramp path that snake eyes took it takes them a little longer to get down the mountain yeah that's yeah. the assumption i'm making here you know uh snake eyes makes it down to there he's at this hotel or, or postal office or did it say exactly Manager, it's a resort. It's whole, yeah it's hotel el pino yep uh, Snake Eyes bleeds on the page, which is a fun touch. You notice the Telex machine? So, uh, you know, in the age of text messaging, this uh-huh. is uh, this is old school text messaging. Yeah. yeah. So so this is not a fax machine? No, no. This is pre-fax. This is an actual Telex machine. It, it references. It says uh, Telex. Oh, yeah. Snake Eyes writes down, I want to send right, a Telex. Right, he does. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And But that's not a fax, though. That is Telex is something different than a fax machine. Uh, I thought that was. I honestly thought that was like European for fax. It's uh, it predates the fax machine. Really? Okay. And, um, well, that's really cool. So while he, you look that up, and while he's doing that, uh, the Snake Eyes punches in the phone number, the secret phone number for the G, uh, Action Force or GI Joe headquarters, Action Force. Uh, while that's happening, that's when the Dreadnoughts catch up to him, and they just break through the window on their motorcycles. So I guess all I see is Telex is still in operation to this day, but not in the sense, you know, described, you know, here. Um, it is a required element of the global maritime distress and safety system. Really? So uh, it's it's a it's different than a fax because it's not image based. It's just text based. Got it. And but it sends like, you know, must sec- send like really short burst. Secure. Very text secure. Messages yeah. OK. Oh, that's in, really cool. In print form. Oh, that's great. Anyway. Uh, they. Uh, Buzzer kicks Snake Eyes. They grab the Telex out of the hands. They realize, well, well, well. Uh, he uses his buzz saw to to cut through the Snake Eyes. Gets a nice pop in the jaw though, and makes his escape. Snake Eyes may be a martial arts expert, but he doesn't know how long he can stay conscious as the wound is slowing him down. So he needs to do something. He steals one of their motorcycles. And I'm sorry, but the idea of Snake Eyes driving away on a motorcycle, shooting another motorcycle with a with a uh, like shooting the gas tank and having it explode, that's a pretty great move. Yeah, that's I'm here for that move all day long, every day. The the editor of Action Force was quoted as saying, "We didn't really hit our stride until issue five. Oh yeah. So he said we spent a little bit too much time doing you know some espionage and whatnot mm-hmm. you know in the very, beginning, very bondy. Very but he's bondy. like, look, yeah. it's Action Force. Yeah." It's got to be an action comic. It's true. So in yeah. his estimation, issue five is where they really ratcheted up the action. I agree. And, uh, I agree. Well, and, Badoom and, says it all. Yeah. And what did we talk about in four? It was very, um, uh, they, they spent, of the five pages, they spent a fair amount on the um, the court intrigue of it all. Right. You know? So yeah. So this is now the flip of that. And the telex gets received by um, Alpine and... So this is Dusty. Yes. He's looking a lot like Footloose from earlier. Very Footloosey. But this is Dusty. This is Dusty, yeah. He doesn't look at all like Dusty, but they do say that he's Dusty. No helmet. No helmet. Uh, so now we've got that uh, that uh, reprint of that sinking feeling. We've also got the tack page previously mentioned. Ace talking about the uh, X-14F Sky Striker. Footloose talking about the M16 that they use. Got a little glossary of terms here. Yeah, and my um, only gripe is Footloose is talking about the M16 and the M203 grenade launcher. Mm-hmm. His action figure came with an M16, did not come with the grenade launcher. Uh-huh. So really, it should have been Leatherneck talking about the M203. Because, I, like, I like that. You know, I like that. And and Leatherneck was a part of Action Force. Yep. So, you know. Oh, yeah. We, um, didn't we read? We read one of the stories where Leatherneck went into the... In one of the annuals? You yes, mean? in one of the annuals. So that was later on. Yeah, but. yeah, yeah. But Leatherneck like went undercover and found his old mates, and they were all a bunch of like doomsday preppers who thought the war never ended. Right, right, right. 
Uh, and then at the end here, the last page, we get a little, uh, there's an ad- advertisement for a subscription. Uh, and we also get a little um, comic strip called Co- Codename Comrade Colin. Combat Colin. Combat Colin, sorry. And so we wouldn't know this, but I've heard enough about it from other people that uh-huh. this became a mainstay oh, in yeah. Action Force. Really? And so uh, it's... Done by Lou Stringer. Completely different tone. Yeah. Yeah, um, it's, it's like Beetle Bailey-ish. But with an art style that's more Fred Hembeck, um, it actually he looks like. But essentially, he's an overzealous uh, individual with uh, guns. It, yeah, yeah, he's got a lot of guns. And you meet uh, Colin, and you meet his mom in, yeah. in the first issue. And then the final page is a commercial for Transformers. We got um, introduction to uh, Combaticons, Stunticons, Protectobots, and Aerial Bots. The sets yeah, it's actually buy the actual toys. All of which were buy all five, and they become this. Yeah. You know. Man, I Voltron esque. I love those. They tried to do it with Battle Force <laughs> 2000, and what a failure on the GI Joe side. Yeah, but I love that idea, man. I love those Transformers toys where the Combaticons and stuff. I was a sucker whenever they'd show up on the cartoons. I was like, yes, yes, teams. And they tried it, and they did. Obviously, they did the teams with like Tiger Force and stuff. But that was we've talked about this before. That was a little bit right right after I left collecting, so that the team part of it wasn't really up my alley. Um, but the combining thing that Joe's had ever figured out a way to really get the actual toys to actually do that well, because Battle Force, not well. Yeah. That would have been huge, man. If they ever, if they ever do, I don't know if Lenny has any plans to do yeah. Battle Force 2000 and G.I. Joe Snart. Classified. Ralph Snart. Okay. That's who I'm thinking of. Oh, Ralph yeah. Snart. Yeah, I'm sorry. Go ahead. No, 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 no. You're not. Anyway, I'm just saying. Uh, I know there's there's plenty of detractors for Battle Force 2000 out there, but I sure would like to see uh, them uh, give it a, another go and actually make it work. Not related to Action Force. Yeah, Ralph <laughs> Ralph Snart, ladies and gentlemen, that is exactly who I'm thinking of as far as art style that 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 looks similar to this guy. So if you... real quick on Action in issue five, yeah, there, yeah, yeah. Uh, we might have missed it, but we got to see Action Force's Geneva headquarters for the first time when Dusty and Alpine appear. Oh, right. So um, you know, again, this idea that they're international heroes, they have bases all over the world. So now we've seen their London base, we've seen their Geneva base, and they've done a great job of introducing new people. So yeah. in that case, they just give us one panel, but now it's Alpine and Dusty, yep. you know, are, are in the mix now. Yeah. Um, and then those two carry you forward. So really do a great job with carrying you forward from week to week. Yeah. Um, yeah, I definitely think so. Issue six, fun cover. I wouldn't say great just because it's it doesn't have much of layout. But it's a fun cover. It's a leaping Crimson Guardsman who looks looks great. Like I like I love all the detail on him. It feels like he's spraying a gun. So that gun then kind of takes the eye. So you don't need a lot of the details on the leg, but it looks like one of those drawings where like they kind of just rendered the, the body and we're like, let's just finish the leg somewhere else. And also like the background is reddish orange. Yeah. And, you needed a different color background. You know, it's like red on red almost. Correct. Yeah. Yeah. I agree. It's not the greatest cover, but it's a fun rendering of that CG. There are some later covers in Action Force Weekly with Crimson Guard that I think are far superior. To Ooh, this. Okay. So, well, I'm excited to get to those. Yeah. All right. So, if you're going week to week, you're like, why are we all of a sudden at the Eiffel Tower? Because well, that's what I was like. I was like, all of a sudden, they were doing a good job of like carrying us forward. And then all of a sudden, we're at the Eiffel Tower. Oh, but there's a good reason. Well, Cobra Commander did mention in the last... Oh, he did. Two issues ago. Two issues ago. So in issue four, he's like, we're going to go and we're going to bomb. We're going to Paris next. Yeah. 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 So, so now we're at the Eiffel Tower. Um. We've got two Crimson Guardsmen, a Fred series and a uh, Fred Wiener series. I don't know. Did they ever give her a name? They don't even refer. So I don't even think Fred series is a thing no, in they... Action Force. So they, they discuss. He looks like a Fred series because he's a blonde, you know, Caucasian guy. But, um, but they, yeah, they don't call him Fred, but they do say um, they don't. They, lo- they mention that they they uh, everyone here looks so ordinary. And uh, and actually, it's Alpine who's French. Because he says, uh, is so uh, ordinary. Yeah. Um, but then they say, Cobra's Crimson Guards are made to seem just that, Alpine. They pose as uh, as as respectable citizens until the day they get the call. So, yeah, you're right. It's not necessarily a Fred series, per se. And they but they're doing the it, same thing. Yeah, a little bit in Mission Control. They talk about the Crimson Guard. They give you kind of a little preview of, again, uh-huh. what you're going to read. And the biggest difference here is that, yeah, it's men and women and mm-hmm. in the beginning. And, and they're not all – they don't all look the same. Yeah. Uh, so if it's Alpine, it's Lady J. Airtight, 
makes an appearance, which is awesome. Uh, oh. And then Dusty. And a little confusing. Uh, well, why are tights there? Hostile environment, you know. Uh... <laughs> well, well, yes, confusing because later on though, there's there's something that's very confusing about it. They again because we don't have any time. There's five pages here. You very quickly go to a Superman shot of the Crimson Guardsman uh, revealing his Crimson Guard uniform underneath it. Yeah, uh, they've spotted the Joes, and he screams, "Death to the enemies of Cobra!" And they throw a singular thermite grenade. It's crazy to think that one grenade in a comic that's full of grenades. Yeah. You know, no one throws more grenades than G.I. Joe comics. This one grenade causes such problems. Alpine even goes on with a thought bubble to say this thermite grenade could reduce the entire tower to a heap of molten. Yeah. It's got a 60 second timer, which he happens to know for some reason. Yeah. Uh, And he's only got 20 seconds left by the time we get to that thought bubble. So a little suspension of disbelief there. (laughs) Um, Yeah, a little bit. The lady knocks Alpine off the tower. What I wanted to see here. To, to critique it a little bit is Alpine use his gear. Yeah. He should have roped it. Like when he got knocked off, he should have quickly grabbed his, his, his hook rope and, and boom, done that. Instead, he grabs it like a superhero. Yeah. I really would have preferred him using his tools because that's what's so great about the toy Alpine. He's got those great tools. Instead of dislocating his shoulder. But yes, yeah. yes, yes, absolutely. <laughs> uh, doing something that no human would ever be able to do. Sure. Um, so, so Alpine kind of takes the stage here. He has caught this thermite grenade. Dusty is in the process of beating the tar out of the, the first Crimson Guardsman. He gets the drop and he shoots Dusty in the head. Helmet, but still the head of the helmet. A glancing blow. Gl- sure, sure, <laughs> sure. Glancing blow. We'll call it that. Um, Looks more like Footloose again because Dusty yeah, he doesn't, really, yeah, have, he doesn't you know, look his, like Dusty. His yeah. neck cover. I forget what Ron Rudat called that piece. It's like a, yeah, I don't know. Anyway, there's yeah, a name for it. Yeah. Lady J gets the drop on that soldier, and while that's happening, with, with a set of tools, Alpine is dismantling this thermite grenade. So it's not the, we have 20 seconds to get rid of it. It's We have 20 seconds to open it and defuse it. That's right. And it's a grenade. It's not a bomb. It's not a big old machine or something with wires. He has to pop open a grenade without it exploding, and it, a timer has already been set, and... Luckily, I say this, and I mean this with all the love in my heart, I'm glad they didn't try to draw that. Because yeah. it would have looked real, as I'll say dumb, as dumb as this <laughs> sequence is, it would have looked really dumb if we were watching him take apart a grenade with a tiny screwdriver in 20 seconds and somehow diffuse whatever is going on inside that grenade. Yeah. So... But you have to understand each of these seconds, because each panel is yeah. like a second oh, it's going all forward. Fractions, milliseconds. Uh, yes, but what they accomplish in each one second, what some of these characters so are able much. to say. Yes, in so that much. Second. Yeah, they're, they're definitely yeah, so drawn they're, out. It's a nine panel grid, which I'm a huge fan of from the Keith Giffen Legion days. This yeah. is predates that, of course. But in at nine seconds, Dusty is getting shot in the head. At eight seconds, Alpine is starting to open the uh, grenade. Open the grenade. Yeah. At seven seconds. Jay has her pistol or machine gun on the CG and says, forget it, creep. At six seconds, Alpine is still working on the grenade. He's nearly there. Five seconds, This is and this is where I go, I think they misunderstood what a hazardous material outfit does and what a, a non-flammable outfit. Although I guess he could be. I guess it would be done. But Airtight gets absolutely destroyed by a flamethrower. Airtight is hit with a flamethrower. Our hazmat suit's Inflam like non flammable? I don't feel like they are. Seems like barbecue might be a better choice. Right. Here. Yeah. So so airtight is completely snookered by this lady's flamethrower. At four seconds, Alpine realizes I'm not gonna make it. I'm not gonna make it. At three seconds, airtight has now stood up and said, uh, I don't normally hit ladies. But I've got a second to spare. But this image of Airtight is one of it's the most epic. It's pretty. Airtight's never been drawn more epically. I mean, that's great. I, I don't know if I ever needed to see that drawing of, of Airtight. But now sure. that I have, I love it. Yeah, like, yeah. I'm here for it. And with two seconds left, Alpine does it. He says, quote, I've done it. So we hear a little click. And so he's dismantled it. Then I guess it would be one second. Airtight punches this lady in the face. <laughs> There's a lot in nine seconds. A lot going on. There's a lot to accomplish yes. in nine seconds. Yes. Uh, we get a little bit of a wrap up. Crimson Guards was very upset. And the jo- the Joes, the Action Force learns that this is the tip of the iceberg in a uh, in a 
in a nod to Fast and Furious 9, 10, whatever the latest one was, they've also bombed Rome. Yep. Rome is in flames. Rome is on fire. Yeah. Rome is the Joe's, or the X Force missed it. Cobra has attacked Rome. That singular thermite grenade that went to Rome, apparently, went off. Yeah. They didn't have notorious bomb expert Alpine there to dismantle it. I think a tripwire could have shown up. Yeah, you know, you know, Snake Eyes told them about Paris, but yeah. he didn't tell them that he the commander had Rome. said, I'm going to burn yeah. the world. Yeah, and so <laughs> um, so that's Trent, I believe, Yep, saying, uh, talking to Flint, is a gentleman. They, they, they'll they think we've failed. They'll be cocky. It's time we gave them a taste of their own medicine. We're going to wipe out Cobra's London operation for good. I like that Trent's focus on London, and he doesn't care about Rome. Well, you know. <laughs> <laughs> Trent's like, let Rome burn. For queen and country. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Action force, or as they say in the cartoon, full force. Yeah, yeah. We're uh, <laughs> Rome's on fire, but we're going to focus on getting them out of London. Well, in fact, they're like rats. We'll, we'll root them out of London. They'll go back to Rome and the, let the Italians deal with it because uh, we're not yet the EU. The EU, I believe, had not yet been established, if memory serves. That is correct. So therefore, yeah. therefore then, they're like, uh, take that Italy. That's for World War II. Is what they're saying there. So you go uh, past the uh, past the Joe story, which was um, part two of the sinking feeling. Yeah, part two is sinking feeling, and then on the final page we got another code name Combat Colin, uh, another Flint uh, by this, and the back page we got an ad for Battle Beasts, air or fire, wood, water. That's what they're they battle for fun. That yeah, you now you can play the <laughs> mystical three sided challenge with the new Battle Beasts. Oh, the, so it's like it's like a rock, paper, scissors. Yeah. So to reveal it, you must rub the special battle badge, and it could be firewood or water. Fire burns wood. Wood floats on water. Water puts out fire. But no one knows the secret until you buy them. So you got to buy more battle beasts. That's right. Because you got to make it happen. I did find it interesting uh, using that iconic image of Flint uh, that we've seen a oh, few yeah. times now. Yeah. Um, th- because we had the subscription subscription service here in the states, this is how they would do it. So basically, if you wanted to subscribe to the comic, you yeah. had your parents fill out this little this little form and cut it out of the comic. Although it does note, you know, if you don't want to destroy your comic, have them Xerox this page, fill it out, and, and tell it in. it us to it. But but just this idea that you don't they're not asking for you for any money. You literally put your name down, you put your address. Well, not asking for any money. So so just just read that real quick. Uh, please reserve a copy of X First from every. Oh, deliver it with your regular paper order. Oh, so you know what this is? This is your. It's like your. Um, do you know this or right? Yeah. Yeah. Oh, okay. It's it's no, no. I don't know the details, but it's like if you have. Yeah, well, it's like a newspaper delivery. Yes. And you pay for that monthly. Right. So they're saying add this to my monthly news newspaper descri- subscription. Right. So I would pay for my Action Force in arrear. So this isn't for. This isn't for it to be sent to your home separately. This is for it to be bundled in with your newspaper. Right. And then your mom and dad would pay for it at the end of the month instead of $4 for the month's worth of newspapers. It's $4 and, and a pence. Yeah. And, uh, well, wait. Well, we know this. It's uh, 32 pence, so 120, 128 extra pence. But I just find it interesting that it was tied into the newspaper Yeah, service. oh, very much so. So, like, very. you'd go, because in the U.S. it wasn't that way. Right. You know, when you subscribe for a newspaper, it's yeah. not like, here, would you like this G.I. Joe comic? Well, I wonder if this... I wonder if this was done also like did would they hand that like was it delivered to their house or was it or was it reserved at the the newsstand you got the option so it says it'll either be delivered with your newspaper or you can have it held and you can come and pick it up yeah so you know for any of those children that were like you know early collectors early adults in life they're like well have them hold it for us because then it won't get maimed yeah yeah, yeah. uh otherwise you know well uh, michael this michael this is exciting we cover, we did it, man. First Wait. issue of of Joe Nye loves Action Force. First six issues. We covered a lot. I think um, uh, I think it's exciting. All right, it's a, it's an exciting book. Something different. It is. Um, I I think it's, I think the shortness of the stories, the page restrictions, as we've seen a lot of cre- creative venues. When you have restrictions, sometimes it brings out the best. The really the the cream of the story rises. We I had recently done the um, uh, 3D books, and yeah. those felt a little bloated, yeah, because they had a lot of pages to fill. 
They were, you know, more, they were 32 or something length pages. And the stories really were bloated out. If those were shrunk, they would have been a much better adventure. And in this, that's what we're getting. We're just getting these action, action, action with really, really great 80s style Marvel art. Yeah, yeah. And, you know, the thing is, um, these have never been reprinted. Yeah. So. Do we know, you have any idea why? Is it is it a rights issue or an what interest I, issue? So, so, and I don't know, I don't. What I know is this. So, so Marvel UK um, basically was around mm-hmm. until 1999, uh-huh. at which point they folded because Panini out of Italy essentially took them over. So um, Marvel no longer had Marvel UK was was no more. And so and in that time before 1999, they just didn't have the thought to reprint these. Uh-huh. Um, when Disney bought Marvel. Uh, they had an edict that no original content was to um, was to originate outside of the United States. Mm. So at that time, Panini could no longer, you know, European writers, artists couldn't come up with original content. Uh-huh. And so um, basically Panini can now reprint, you know, material, but they can't do their own original content. So in all of that, you know, where are the rights to Action Force Weekly? Um, I'm not sure. Yeah. I, that might be why the Blood for the Baron can just host them. Because no one really knows to raise a stink. Right. You know, or or maybe no one knows it's happening. So I hope they don't listen to this there and ruin everyone's good time is what I'm saying. <laughs> so, uh, Michael, thank you so much for joining us. Um, we'll be back with another episode of, uh, of Joe Nye Loves Action Force. So so buckle in, strap down, and I hope you enjoy this. Strap down, buckle it in. I don't know how that goes. But either way, get ready. Uh, because now you Joe Nye, Joe Nying is half the battle.